All right, welcome to class number 11 about Lutheranism enduring the Third Reich. And uh, today we're going to be, I know we didn't finish everything last week, but we're going to be moving on to uh, the Arian Jesus. And we'll come back to some of that previous material that we missed at a, at a different time. But I wanted to make sure that we got all of this in today. Uh, this, uh, the subtitle of this is how Jesus was made compatible with Nazism. And it's a, it's a provocative title because you have to scratch your head and wonder, how do you do that? Well, they tried. And so we'll hear about that. Um, and uh, we'll talk about Arianism. And I, I uncovered a lot of interesting things for researching this part of the study that I think you'll find uh, to be quite, uh, to quite memorable. So I want to start out by talking about Nazism itself. And Nazism frequently has this uh, allegation that it, it is racist. And I, I want to um, unpack that more because it's more than that. Uh, so the Nazis are often seen as being racist in their persecution of the Jews, but it's, this is not a complete picture of their ideology. Uh, and then I have that, that there, there certainly were these, these physical stereotypes that they made of Jewish people, and they used these things in their propaganda, right? So that, that was a – it went beyond seeing the Jewish people as a race, which they did. you know. And, and we obviously see Judaism as a religion. But but they saw it as as having to do uh, not so much with, with skin color, right? Because uh, people were, were the same color in a lot of instances. But uh, that it extended to blood and lineage and ancestry, and it was about who you were descended from. It wasn't about what your the color of your skin was. So it, it was something much deeper for for the Nazis. And uh, then the other part of this is something that is always missed and is, is something that I don't even think is widely even considered when you talk about this. But it wasn't just a physical thing, but, but Nazism added a spiritual component to their hatred of the Jewish people, that they, they saw the Jewish people as morally and spiritually degenerate. And so it wasn't just a physical thing, but that there was this, this moral aspect that they believed was threatening to the people of Germany. And so I have down here that uh, in order to prevent contamination of the Germanic Aryan people, because there was the fear that this spiritual degeneracy of the Jewish people could spread somehow and that it would corrupt the 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 non-Jewish German people. So they they saw it as their uh, mission of sorts to get rid of this in society. And so Hitler set out to eliminate those he saw as physically degenerate, which would be the mentally impaired, the physically impaired, but also the morally degenerate, which would be the people in this category, the Jewish people, the gypsies, uh, the communists. And, and this was all being done in order to uh, evolve the society. And, and this goes back to our earlier discussion on eugenics, right? That you could uh, weed out or breed out the undesirable traits and, and create this master race of people, right? So all of this is, is figuring into the, the Nazi ideology. Now... Uh, one of the, I, I would say, leading scholars in looking into the connections between Jesus and Arianism and Nazism uh, is, a, is a Dartmouth professor by the name of Susanna Heschel. And, and she's got a lot of videos on YouTube, and she's written a lot of articles about this. And, and she's done some firsthand research where she actually went to Germany. Uh, she's, a, uh, she's Jewish. She went to Germany to try and, and dig into the roots of how Christianity was involved in Nazism. This became something of an interest to her. And uh, so I, I have some slides of hers that I'm using from YouTube uh, during a lecture that she gave, how Jesus became a Nazi, Christian theologians in the Third Reich, which is another provocative title. So, uh, she uncovered uh, a man by the name of Walter Grundman, who 
we really have never heard of, but he, he was quite popular in Germany. He is a German academic theologian uh, who was around at the time of uh, the Second World War. And uh, he became the founder of this institute that sought to de-Judaize the church, to de-Judaize society. That, that after a couple of years, uh, there was this desire among theologians, Christians, to further the objectives of the Deutsche Christians that we talked about last week, and to have a Christianity that did not have anything Jewish to it at all. And there was actually an institute about this, and, and we may get to talking about that, but she uncovered the existence of the institute because it had been forgotten about, and she found an obscure footnote about it uh, at some um, university library, and she had to keep doing some digging and some archives. She went to different cities, and finally, after many years of of pushing and and coming back um, time and time again, they finally gave her this information. Uh, but uh, this is one of the things that uh, Grunman said. The elimination of Jewish influence on German is an urgent and fundamental question of the present German religious situation. Jewish influence on all areas of German life, including on religious church life, must be exposed and broken. So this was the agenda of the, uh, of the Institute. And uh, you know we're going to be hearing from Grunman uh, a little bit more today. So this was something else that he said. The decisive German struggle for the freedom and life of our Volk, which remember is the German word for, for people, but it has broader connotations to that, going back to soil and blood, right, reveals itself all the more clearly as a struggle against the degenerating and destructive powers in all realms of life. Everywhere behind these degenerative powers, the Jew is visible. So again, we're, we're really focusing, the Nazi ideology is focusing really on this spiritual or moral quality of Jewish people that they thought was a threat to German people. We're, we're moving beyond race here, and we're trying to locate some moral corruption, failing, um, uh, something that you just could not trust about the Jewish people. And, and I think that you know, some of the connections that they have with well, the Jewish people uh, crucified Jesus, that also ties into this and, and, and gets them to be seen as more of an enemy to the Germans. All right. Now, of course, Jesus cannot really be worshipped by Arians if he's Jewish. So that's a problem. We have to fix that, all right? So uh, the way they sought to fix this is, was kind of interesting. Jesus, as we know, spent much of his time up in Galilee. And Galilee, uh, and I'll show this to you on the map on the next page, uh, but Galilee is in the north, Jerusalem is in the south. Uh, Galilee is considered to be, in the scriptures, the place where it's not trustworthy because, you know, we, we remember the words, can anything good come from Nazareth? Nazareth, Nazareth is up in Galilee. So that's how the, the people in Jerusalem saw Galilee, because it had been decimated by uh, the Assyrians who had conquered it many centuries before and resettled it with other people who then intermarried with any of the remaining Jews who were there. So it was a <laughs> to the Jewish people of the time. They were less Jewish, not trustworthy, and it you know this this thing kind of repeats itself in history. But um, there was actually a small village up in Galilee called Bethlehem. Very obscure, very not well known to us, and you probably would not have ever even known this if I didn't mention it today, right? But there is this. Bethlehem of the Galilee, close to Nazareth, right? And, and so that's all the way up in the north. And then you go down south, not far from the Dead Sea, and you have Bethlehem of Judea, okay? So 
uh, up here by the Sea of Galilee. Then the Jordan River connects the two, right? And so you have this Bethlehem of, of the Galilee. And, uh, you know, this was uh, taken from a man named Ernest Lohmeyer, who I actually just discovered a lot more about him this morning. And, and he is such an interesting figure. He was a, uh, a Lutheran pastor, Lutheran academic also, who uh, opposed the Nazis. But, but he's really largely been forgotten by history. And uh, he, he was writing a lot of things at the time. I don't know all that much about him as of yet, but I just ordered a book about him this morning uh, that was, it's called something along the lines of uh, between the swastika and the sickle. Because he, uh, he makes it through the Nazi era, even though he opposes them and, and he defends the Jewish people and, and all of that. He somehow winds up in East Germany after the war. And in 1946, he is arrested by the communists and the communists execute him. And, and so he, he really just can't seem to, to get get a break but but he was uh you know interestingly a lutheran pastor well he came up with or wrote about um something called uh, two-site eschatology eschatology remember talk, talking about the end of the world the end of the age and uh, you know dr heschel in her lecture professor heschel says she quotes this from from john seven forty one. but some asked surely the messiah does not come from galilee does he? Had not the scripture said that the Messiah is descended from David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David lived? Well, some have said that he, the Messiah comes from Galilee. So this is kind of out there. And uh, I, I haven't, like I said, I haven't read this much yet, but um, from what Heschel says, Lohmeyer comes up with this two-side eschatology where there is sort of this understanding of Jesus as the Son of Man from Galilee versus Jesus as the Messiah from Bethlehem of Judea. And it's, he was talking about it not from a Nazi perspective, not from an Aryan perspective, but when the Aryans, the Nazis later found out about that, they jumped on that. And they liked that because that was a way for them to Aryanize Jesus and to, to divorce him from being born in, in the South, being a descendant of King David, and uh, locating him further up in the North. And uh, there's some other interesting things about the North here. But uh, before I do that, this isn't just a, uh, a thing that was interest of to the people of the 19th and 20th centuries. This is an article uh, from today uh, from an uh, Israeli publication. Was Jesus born in a different Bethlehem? You know, anytime scholarship can kind of dig up something that they feel is going to upset the uh, apple cart and turn everything on its head, uh, somebody's going to publish that and, and try and become famous, right? So, uh, an antiquities authority archaeologist argues that the Christian Savior hailed from Galilee, not Judea. Uh, John David? This is a book denial of Jesus' existence in the first place because Jesus' existence depends on fulfilling the Messianic prophecy, which they wanted that Jesus be born in Bethlehem. Yes, the prophecies do say that Jesus is going to be born in Bethlehem of Judea, but if you're an Aryan, you don't want it to say that. So you you have to, you know, you have to erase that. You have to, you know, el eliminate part of Jesus's history to, to remake him. And this is what the, the Nazis wanted to do. The theologians who signed on with, uh, with Nazism. You know, last week we talked about um, the Deutsche Christian and how there was this movement to combine Nazism and Christianity. And you wonder how many people really believed in that. And I showed you a lot of the rallies and the, the conventions. 
to, to show you that there were a lot of people who believed in that. And, and there were uh, a lot of theologians who signed on to that. Um, Heschel makes the point Hitler wasn't sure how the churches would react to him in 1933. But then she says by 1935, they were drooling over him because he's captivating all of Germany. And, you know, I mean, there, there's probably as many different sentiments as there are Germans, but but people thought it was their patriotic duty to support him. Now, it's not common knowledge that the concentration camps are, uh, you know, in the planning stages and all of this early on. So, you know, that that's not really all known until the end of the war, although there are rumors, right? But let's talk about Arianism itself. So I have here, Arianism was hard to define even for the Nazis because it's not this concrete thing that you can trace in history or in genealogy or anything like that. It's sort of something of the stuff of legend and you've got to take it and you've got to make the legend the truth. So uh, there were some Vedic or Indian texts that mentioned this great conquering people or clan or clans of people who migrated from Iran, which is thought to be the origin of Aryan. <laughs> now, I know that sounds kind of funny, um, but that the Aryans came from Iran or India and, and they eventually migrate and they settle in Europe. And then they, they kind of split up. There's the, the Aryans, I guess, who settle in Germany. And then there's, and, and they focus on, on the concept of nation. And then there are other people who also went and settled maybe elsewhere, but they focused more on religion. And uh, so the term Aryan is first used by uh, a man by the name of Max Mueller in the 19th century. He's an Indian studies scholar who originally interprets these, these Indian or Vedic texts. And, and I don't know how many of you know this, but, but the swastika is like a Hindu or Indian symbol, right? So it's thought that maybe that's, that's how this all comes about. Uh, and, and we had talked about these two gentlemen, uh, De Gobineau and, and Houston Chamberlain. These were academics who, who wrote uh, in the late 19th century century uh, about Arianism and language and migration and the movement of peoples. And Hitler was influenced by them, and they, they were giving Hitler these ideas about Aryans and the master race and language and peoples uh, settling in, in, these different, in these different parts. And so this ties into the, the German notion of Volk and blood and soil, and that is to be distinguished among the Semitic people and the Slavic people, you know, uh, Russia and, and things like that, who were considered to be inferior. So now you have all of that. It, it's not just simple racism for, for, for the Nazis, but uh, it's, it's, it's much deeper than that. Um, you know, they're, they're going deeper into people's biology. They're, they're, associating you know spirituality with biology and and viewing themselves as the ones now who need to cleanse Europe and cleanse Germany uh, and, and not just Germany because remember they go to Poland they invade Poland and they you know set up a lot of the death camps in Poland so it wasn't just a German thing they were they were exporting. All right, so uh, this institute that I was talking to you about, um, they develop all their own resources. They have their own Bible. They have their own catechism. They have their own hymnals. And they're disseminating these things. And so this was, uh, their, this was their, in their catechism. Jesus of Nazareth in the Galilee proves in his message and behavior a spirit that is in opposition to Judaism in every way. The struggle between him and the Jew became so bitter that it led to his deadly crucifixion. So there's that connection. Thus, Jesus cannot have been a Jew. Until this very day, the Jews persecute Jesus and all who follow him with unreconcilable hatred. 
By contrast, Arians in particular found in Jesus Christ the answer to their ultimate and deepest questions, so he became the savior of the Germans. You know, we're again, we're mixing soil and race and, and nationality with religion. And, and we're, we're combining this all together. We're taking Jesus way out of context and, and remaking him so that now he can fit our narrative or, you know, the Nazis are saying they can fit their narrative and uh, make this palatable for them. So here's, here's the Nazi hymnal. You've got the, the German stormtroopers, you know, with the, you're singing now the, the hymns and I don't, I don't read this German. So I don't know exactly what it says, but it, it looks very, you know, like old school hymnals, like, you know, we would see, but you know, they've got the, the stormtroopers coming out because you, you wanted hymns that reinforced your understanding of not just Jesus, but of the people, the church and the church, you know, the church militant to them was cleansing Germany of the morally degenerate people. And, and that was their mission from God, right? All right, so I actually do want to have some time to get into the word of God this time because I always feel we're running short on that. Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. So let's turn there. Let's read that. And uh, let's see. Huh. John David, are you there? Will you read it loud? Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came from Jerusalem. All right, so the New Testament says Bethlehem of Judea, but, uh, you know, even in the New Testament, we've got to scrub some things. Right. We've got to scrub these encounters. We've got to scrub the genealogies of Jesus that, that trace him back through Jewish roots. So the genealogy that starts the Gospel of Matthew has to go. Right. Because we, we can't we can't have that. Uh, but the Gospel, of course, does say that that Jesus is born. And interestingly, maybe maybe Matthew, even aware of the Bethlehem. In, of the Galilee specifically says here of Judea, because maybe he's trying to emphasize that so that there won't be any questions. Uh, John 4.22, salvation is, quote, from the Jews. Uh, Alan, are you there? You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. All right, so this is this uh, encounter between Jesus and um uh, the Samaritan woman, right? And uh, Jesus gets into this dialogue with her at the at the well, and uh, you know she's there because the Samaritans say that you worship on this mountain, and the Jews worship in Jerusalem, and and who is right? And and Jesus gets into this discussion, and we have this inconvenient reference uh, for Nazism that salvation is is from the Jews, okay? Now, th this next part is very important. You know, we all know John 3.16. What about 1 John 3.16? Interestingly enough, the crucifixion does not occur because Jesus is conquered by a corrupt people, but because Jesus voluntarily lays down his own life for, for all sinners. Right? The, the, the Nazis want to make Jesus a victim of circumstance that the corrupted Jewish people apprehended him and crucified him, and they're to blame for this, and we should now go after them because it's time to take vengeance upon, upon this. Because now we're also making Jesus into this Aryan hero, and we're going to talk more about this uh, next week, but First John 3.16, is anyone there? Uh, Brennan, read it loud, please. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. Okay, he laid down his life for us. That's a, a voluntary thing that Jesus does in order to 
affect our salvation, that that it's not he is he is not a victim. And, and it's very important in the Gospels that that is stated. That that God is submitting himself. Jesus is submitting himself to the the corrupt justice system of this world. Right. OK, how about John 10, 11? Uh, Wes. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. All right. Jesus lays down his life for the sheep. He's sacrificing himself for the sheep because that's how salvation works. That um, that's what's happening. And and then here, the crucifixion of Jesus is the Father's will. Luke twenty two forty two. Anyone there? Brennan. Okay. Saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. All right. So Jesus prays before the crucifixion uh, because he's, he knows it's going to be an event of agony. Uh, take this cup of suffering from me. But not my will be done, but your will be done. Jesus entrusts himself to the Father's will, which it is the Father's will for, for Jesus to be the sacrifice. Official land and all people that that this is not like as it somehow got misrepresented in history um the jewish people coming together and uh overpowering jesus and and crucifying him now we, we have talked about this because we've looked at the parables that end matthew's gospel that it, it it is a part of the plan that jesus is crucified by his own people Right? And, and that that is a part of this, but it's not the only part, right? Because the, the Gentiles are involved, the Romans are involved, and the scriptures themselves paint the wider picture that Jesus does this voluntarily. It's part of the Father's will, and it's necessary for salvation. So all of that really needs to be considered, but... From the Nazis to even way before them, they, they lose sight of this. And they, they, they tend to focus exclusively on the, the Jewish role in this. And they uh, make it so much bigger, more universal, uh, and, and put the blame of all of this on the Jewish people. And that then gives them their cause to go and take vengeance upon them, right? And that's why we, we traced in the earlier parts of the study the history of the, the anti-Judaism that was uh, maybe started, I don't know, a little bit in the early church, but then really gets going in the Middle Ages. And all of that now feeds into moving into the, the 1800s, the 1900s, and, and eventually into you know, the ideology of, of the Nazis. All right, so I did leave some time for questions, thoughts, comments today, which I usually am running out of time. So uh, what do you guys think of all this? I think Nazi exploited the ignorance of most Christians about the scriptures. The Nazis exploited most ignorance of Christians about scriptures, okay? And we, we've talked about that before, and, and as we'll get to in some of the later Lutheran theologians who stood up for... Uh, you know, what was right at the time, um, you know, we'll, we'll later hear from, from Hermann Sasse, who was um, a professor at one of the Lutheran universities, and, and he will talk about that it was a, a sick Lutheranism that, that really had infected Germany, that they didn't uh, understand the totality of what Luther had said, or the totality of what the Lutheran church stands for, but they focused on a couple of, of, of tracks and works and you know we haven't gotten to those yet but we will uh and that's what they got pulled into other thoughts is there anything and i'm not familiar with the forum but is there anything specifically in there that says this jesus was not the son of god that he was not you know, here to save us i mean is there something anti Christ in there. Oh, okay. So the question is, is there anything in the Torah yeah. that says that Jesus was not here to save us? Well, 
the the Torah consists of the first five books of the Old Testament: oh, okay. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. So, you know, there are things that we do get out of there that that do talk about uh, Jesus. You know, Genesis three about the seed of the woman crushing the serpent's head, and uh, you know, the serpent bruising um, his heel, and uh, you know, Deuteronomy when Moses talks about. Uh, another prophet that will, God will raise up and we should listen to him. So we do get these prophetic things, even in the Torah about, about Jesus. Right. But I, I mean, are you, are you more referring to like the old Testament or. Where do their belief that Christ, you know, is not he sent from God, son of God to save us. I mean, what, how do they come up with that? How do they, how do they believe? Well, I, uh, part of that was uh, the, um, the things that we had talked about where they were focusing on the Jewish involvement in the crucifixion. And, and we haven't, uh, we haven't touched all the way on that. We're going to start to get into that next week because next week we're going to start to talk about Adolf Hitler's use of the scriptures. And, and you will see from there what, um, what Hitler does. And that will help to give you some insights into how the German people were also led into this, right? West. I was just thinking, uh, one we haven't touched on is in the book of Acts when Peter says to the crowd during the, the last the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, he says, you crucified him. He's talking to the Jewish leader. And they say, when you know, what must be saved and baptized. So, but there, Peter is condemning his own people for you. You are the people that killed him. Yeah, I mean, so the, there, there is that speech by Stephen in Acts chapter 7, right, where he talks about, you know, you, you are just like your fathers, um, you know, you stiff-necked people, um, persecuting the, the prophets and, and, and things like that. And so, yes, I mean, in some of those speeches, you know, there, there is that language, right, where, where Peter, but of course, Peter himself is a former Jew, right? So it's it's like uh, if you have the former Jews and like the disciples chastising the people who are still Jews, it's not a racial thing or it's not a you, you can't do anything with that. It is a purely religious thing. But uh, as 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 time moved on, Jewish people got taken more and more out of this category of being religious and put into this uh, category of. You know, it was race, it was uh, blood, it was something beyond just religion, right, and faith. So, yeah, I mean, that was that was a part of it, just like we've been talking about. And the Nazis, of course, uh, looked at things that way, too. Of course, the, the Jewish people had their own way of, of doing that as well, because that's how they looked at the Galileans up north. That in, in something of a similar way, as the, it was the way the Nazis looked at the Jews, the Jews in Jerusalem looked at, you know, the, the Galileans up, up to the north, that they were not, you know, real Jews, if you will. And, and in the same way that the Nazis thought the Jewish people were not real Germans. So, you know, we have these things that, that repeat themselves in history. It's, it's not a Jewish thing. It's not a Nazi thing. It's a, it's a human thing. And. You know, we can find many other examples in history where this is done very similarly. You know, if you're familiar with the, the Rwandan genocide in the 90s, you know, where they had the uh, the Tutsi tribe and the, the Hutu tribe, and everybody is the same color. But, you know, I, I remember talking to, to someone about this this once, and and she was of the um, she was of the Tutsi tribe, and so she was the, the persecuted tribe. And I, I said, well, you know, how did people tell who was who? And she's like, well, you could just look at people's faces and you would know. Like just the shape of the nose, the eyes, the mouth, the, the, the features were different. And even though everybody is the same color, people even of the same race can still find ways to discriminate. So it's, you know, there it is. Um, all right, so next week, Hitler's mission. How did Hitler understand or use Jesus? Did Hitler quote Bible verses in his speeches? 
Did Adolf Hitler believe that he was somehow on a mission from God and even see himself as a defender of the Christian faith? You might be surprised. So we'll we'll talk about that next week. And, uh, you know, you'll, you'll be very interested in this. And it will also help shed some light on, on this question of how did the Germans come to believe this about the Jews? Because um, Hitler, I think, really the way he uses scripture and the way he makes his speeches and his arguments makes the connection about what he focused on. Okay. All right. Let's go ahead and uh, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we bless your name. Uh, we know, Lord, that uh, you are the fulfillment, that your son Jesus is the fulfillment of the scriptures of the Old Testament, that the prophets um, had testified to him and that the kings of, of Israel had preceded him. And uh, we, we worship you, Lord, in, in truth and in spirit, and know that your son Jesus voluntarily laid down his life, that we would have the forgiveness of our sins and the promise of life everlasting. Um, help us, Lord, to, to further understand these things and appreciate them as we continue to study more about you. In Jesus' name, amen.